Won't you stand with me with your Bible and open it to the book of Genesis, chapter number 8. Genesis chapter 8 in God's Word. And we're going to read the Scripture together. But first, I don't think we had any fellowship time today. I want you to I want you to look around for somebody you don't know, and then I, here's who I want you to greet. I want you to turn to the person right straight behind you, the one right straight in front of you, and the one on either side of you, and say, hello, and we're glad to have you today in church with us. Will you do that? All right. <laughs> All right, now in your Bible, in your Bible, Genesis chapter number 8, and follow as I begin reading in verse 13, please. It came to pass in the 601st year. Notice how precise the Bible is. You see, this is an eyewitness writing this, and so... Uh, It can be very precise, dates, times, places. It came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark. That would be the the roof, we would call it. He looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 7th and 20th day of the month, was the earth dried. And God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee, of all flesh, both of fowl, of cattle, of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. In other words, he repeated that Genesis 1 uh, command again. So Noah went forth, and his wives, and his sons, and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. He took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, And he offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, a sweet odor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. And while the earth remaineth, Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Thank you, and you may be seated. So now Noah and his family had been on the ark for 367 days. We calculated that last week. On the old calendar, which was 30 days to the month and 12 months to the year, the old calendar that was used up until hundreds of years later, Noah had spent one year and one week exactly on the ark. I hear people talk about it, and you would think that, they, they, uh, that Noah and his family were on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, no, that's how long it rained. He was on the ark a year and a week. I tried to imagine what it would be like to be Noah standing in the door of the ark. he just taken the roof off. The sun is shining. The earth has dried up. He's been there with those animals and his family a year and a week. He looks out over the earth, the landscape in front of him, and he views the post-flood world. I think it was described in the book of Psalms, number 46, which I preached on two weeks ago on Wednesday night, In Psalm 46 and 8, it says, What desolations God hath made in the earth. What desolations hath he made in the earth. 
because the earth would have been absolutely desolate. I tried to preach on this week, on, on this last week, and describe to you and give you a feeling of what the flood was really about. And it's not the little cartoon cover on the children's Bible story book with the giraffe and the elephant sticking, or the elephant sticking their heads out the door. It was, it was the most devastating time in all of human history. It was the time when literally God just wiped the earth clean other than for the people on, on the ark. And so he looks out. All he could have seen was a barren mud plain. Not a single living creature was moving other than those that had been on the ark. Not a single tree was growing. Not a single plant. Not a blade of grass sticking up out of the ground. No doubt, rotting corpses of animals and people littered the place. Ugly mounds of dirt and rock and debris. You know how it looks after a flood down on the Mississippi or on the P.D. River. If you go down there and look beside it, it's one of the ugliest sights you'll ever see, just debris and dirt and, and, and uh, broken limbs and so on scattered in every direction. What Noah was looking at was the aftermath of God's judgment upon the earth. That's what the flood was really about. Man had become so wicked, so evil, so corrupt, and so violent that it was impossible for God to allow that evil to continue. And so God brought judgment in the form of the flood. Jesus prophesied, remember, and I've mentioned this numerous times to you now, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be. I would modify that today. As it was in the days of Noah, so is it in our day, or is rapidly approaching that. Days of violence, think about how much violence there is in the world today. Days of corruption, think about the corruption that is in our land. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ said that in Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew chapter 24, he describes the great tribulation period. And so what he's saying is, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the great tribulation period. We're not there yet, but boy, how close might we be. Another universal judgment of God is coming upon the earth. I recently heard a well-known preacher, John MacArthur, I heard him say on his radio program, I was riding in my car, he said, judgment is the message today for the preachers. He said, and at a time when we need that message more than we've ever needed it, people need to be reminded God is about to bring judgment upon this planet. We hear very little about it. We hear a lot of feel-good preaching. We hear a lot of tickling your ears, but we don't hear too enough of that we live on the precipice of God's judgment again as it came here, not in the form of a flood, but in other ways. But that's not the message this morning. My message this morning is Noah's very first priority. Noah's very first priority, and his priority was worshiping. If you will note there, here I've described to you this very bleak scene in verse 20. But Noah stood there that day and decided his first activity would be to build an ark of the Lord. And he took of every clean beast that he had brought on the boat with him, and every clean fowl, and he offered burnt offerings on the altar. He offered up really one-seventh of his wealth to God, if you will study the entire context. The very first act after the flood was to build an an altar, and worship God. Now, an altar and a sacrifice was the prescribed manner of worship in those days. We don't worship with an altar that where we place the body of an animal, as did those people. You remember Abel worshiped that way. Abraham is going to worship that way in about 500 more years. So this was the prescribed manner of how to approach God. And we're gathered here today in a corporate, gathered worship service. I hope we are here to approach God. If you came for any other reason 
then that's the wrong reason. We're here to meet with God, and we're here in a great gathering of people, but we're here one-on-one as well. We want to hear from God. That was Noah's goal, no doubt. And I figured it out that Noah was the busiest man on earth. Well, maybe not. It would be safe to say that Noah was one of the four top busiest men on the earth at this point point in time, would it not? Well, you are slow today, I'll tell you. He's one of the four busiest on the earth. There's only four. And he looks out there, and there's houses to build. Winter's coming because we have seasons now. We didn't have them before the flood. And there's cattle to take care of. And there is a garden to plant because they got to have food. It's food supplies running low on, on the boat. And yet, in spite of all that busyness, those duties and responsibilities that he knows lie before him, he doesn't pursue any of them. He stops and he worships Almighty God in the way prescribed. He builds an altar and he makes a sacrifice. Let me give you a definition of worship. Worship is one of the most familiar terms to Christians today and least understood, I'm convinced. So I hope you'll write down my little definition. Worship is honor and adoration directed to God. Worship is honor and adoration to adore, to to have feelings of love and affection and loyalty. Worship is to honor, to show respect and adoration of feelings of affection and love to God. And he did it in the prescribed manner by offering up those offerings, showing God that he was obedient to what God had commanded. The Hebrew word for worship, worship doesn't, the word is not here, but obviously the whole account is about worship. The Hebrew word for worship is a strange word. It means to kiss the hand, to kiss the hand. And it refers to the days in when the people would come before the king and they would kneel down, they would kiss his hand at his throne. He'd be sitting on the throne. He would extend his hand and the people would kiss the hand. A sign of loyalty, a sign of allegiance, a sign of love to the king that I'm submitting myself to you, king. And so they kissed his hand as the symbol of that. Now, later that word got translated into English, into the Anglo-Saxon. And it's a strange-looking word. The old Anglo-Saxon word is worth-sip, worth-sip, spelled W-E-O-R-T-H-S-C-I-P-E, worth-sip. But it had the same idea that we submit, that we ascribe worth and value to God. And so let's bring that in and, and make an application here today. So we're gathered here in this sanctuary, this church auditorium today. Why are you here? Hopefully not to be seen. I don't think most of you are here for that reason. Uh, we're, we're not here today. To We should not really even be here for what we get. We're here to give to God the honor, the respect, the love and the adoration that he deserves because of who he is. We're here to repay him for all of his blessings, realizing that every good and every perfect gift comes from where? Down from the Father of, heights, uh, Father of lights. And so everything that I have that's good, directly or indirectly, came from God, then would it not be just decent if I would once a week gather with God's people and thank Him and bless His name and praise Him for what He has done? We only have three options, someone said. I read recently. We only worship one of three things. We worship God, and then there's a very small group of people, very small percentage-wise, that worship Satan, 
They literally do. And Paul says in the New Testament, if you worship an idol, if you bow down to an idol figure, you're really worshiping a demon. So the options are you worship God. The option is you worship Satan, but I don't think many do. Here's where we worship. We worship self. And you say, oh, I don't worship myself. Well, listen, worship, another definition of worship is who we put first. It's who is first who is, who, who is, who may, when we have a plan, do we look to God for His plan and His will, or do we just make our plan? And the Lord can live with it. When we dream, are our dreams the dreams that God would want us to dream, or are they the dreams we got from reading the secular magazine? Three options. A, to worship God, I worship Satan, or I worship self. Now, I wanted to call your attention. What a wonderful passage. Here he is getting off of the ark. He's been cooped up in it for a year and a week, and the world is in absolute devastation. Now, God is going to use him to do everything that's going to be done for a while, and yet with all of the duties and responsibilities weighing upon his shoulders, that the whole fate of the world in the future lies upon him in one way, this man stops, and he worships Almighty God. What a, what a powerful, powerful example to us. I want to give you, let's see, I want to give you about five or six benefits of worship, and I hope you might write them down there in the margin of your Bible, because I don't think people think about What this does for me when I truly worship God as I've been trying to describe to you. Number one, worship is the best preparation for the responsibilities and duties of life. Worship is the best preparation for the responsibilities and duties of life. All that he had to do, as we've been talking about, a house to build and a garden to plant, crops, animals to care for, everything that you can think. There was nothing. It was devastation. It was desolation. And with all of that incumbent upon him, he stopped because the best preparation for the responsibilities and duties of life is to worship God. You see, he understood that God, that he was not really in control of his life. God was in control of his life. And so, worship has these benefits that Noah understood. And let me tell you what they are. First of all, worship transformed us. Now, I want you to go to Romans chapter 12 in your Bible. Romans chapter 12 in your Bible. And um, take that slide down, if you will. I changed my outline. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 in your Bible. The benefits of worship, put this one down. First, it's the best preparation for the responsibilities of life. And secondly, it transforms us. It transforms us. Now, what do I mean? Chapter 12, Romans, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, not your animal sacrifice, but your own body as a Christian, a living sacrifice. God doesn't want you dead. He wants you alive right now. He wants you living holy. He wants you to living ex- a way acceptable unto Him. So, we present our bodies to God, and we're changed. It's transformative. When, we, when you worship God and you say, God, I'm here today, I love you, I'm giving you myself, it transforms you. And let me show you what I mean. In verse 2, he says, don't be conformed to the world. So worship prevents me from being conformed to the world. You see, the world is trying to press you into its mold. And if you don't resist that, then you're going to be conformed to it. And worship gives you the tools and the mindset to not be conformed to the world. 
I spoke to a man a few minutes before the service, and he was telling me about a tough week. I had to drop my daughter off at college at one of the major universities. And he said, it broke my heart because now she's in a quad with four or five other girls, but next door to them, they could be boys. He says, it's almost like they set the whole thing up for the kids to be immoral. They put the, test, the temptation and testing all around them today. That's our world. See, all this discussion about homosexuality and and, and transgenderism and all these discussions, all of them at root have to do with making sex available and permissive to anybody, anywhere, anytime. And the world, that will affect you. You will be pressed into that mold if you don't resist it. And you resist it every time you come to church and listen to old leather lungs here holler at you for a while and say, don't do that. And look in verse 2 again. Worship not only prevents conformity to the world, it transforms us by renewing our minds. It transforms us. It makes us think differently. And if we're not in the services of God worshiping Him, we'll think like that world out there. We'll think like the media. We'll think like the books. We'll think like the magazines. We'll think like the whole worldly system. You've got to have something to offset that. Worship is the key. And look in verse 2 again. In worship, God reveals His will. He'll prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And how many people have come to church perplexed about what they need to do in life, and they sat, and the preacher preached, and the Holy Spirit worked, and they found the will of God as they sat and worshiped Almighty God. So worship has so many benefits. It transforms. It keeps us from being conformed. It renews the mind. It reveals the will of God. And as old Noah stood there by that altar and watched those flames lick around that sacrifice, he was opening himself up to follow the will of God in his life. Turn with me to another worship passage. It's Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6 and in verse 1, Isaiah 6 and 1, you'll see something else. It's another benefit of worshiping God. In the year King Uzziah died, see there's the timeline, specific eyewitness accounts in the Bible, I saw the Lord. Just stop right there. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I got a glimpse of God. I got my focus off of Isaiah. I got my focus upon the true and living God. He was sitting on a throne high and lifted up. Oh, boy, is he high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, and it describes them. And one cried into another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The emphasis is upon God's holiness, and the whole earth is full of His glory. It was such a traumatic thing. He said, in the presence of God, the post of the door moved. The doorway moved. At the voice of him that cried, the house was full of smoke. Man, there's a, a sense here of something supernatural beyond any comprehension so wonderful and powerful and great that he's never seen anything like it before. And so worship got his focus off of Isaiah and what he's been describing in these previous chapters here. And worship changes our focus from self to the Lord. And all week long, we tend to think a lot about ourselves. Most of the time we think about ourselves. What I'm going to do, where I'm going to do, go, what I've got to do this week, the duties that are pressing in upon me, uh, and so on. And then we forget about the God that loves us and that we worship if we're not careful. Let me show you what all and many other benefits accrue here. Look in verse 5. In worship, sin is revealed of which we were not conscious when you worship God, the Holy Spirit will bring to your mind sins that are prevalent in your life 
that you hadn't even thought about. That happened to Isaiah, verse 5. He said, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm coming apart, he said. I'm a man of unclean lips. And then he saw that people around him were also people of unclean lips. And he said, that's been revealed to me because my eyes have seen the king. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, hear me. When you see the king, you will see your own failings and your own inadequacies, and you'll see how much we need the grace and love and mercy of Almighty God. Amen? And then he says in verse 5, he confessed his sin. I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. He confessed his sin. And then in verse 6, one of the seraphims flew to me having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid the live coal upon my mouth. And lo, he said, this hath touched thy lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. When we gather and seriously worship God, our sins can be purged by the gospel that we hear and that we value. He was touched by God. The psalmist said, be still and know that I'm God. When people come to church at the Florence Baptist Temple, I want them to enjoy it. They should have a good time because in the Bible, people are joyful when they go up to the house of the Lord. You know that. You read the Psalms. You see it all the time. There ought to be this sense of joyful exuberance. We're here today. We love each other. We love the Lord. We're in His presence. Ma, for a few minutes here, we're just going to check out on everything else, and we're going to focus upon Him. And then as we focus, the Holy Spirit begins to work in the heart, and He convicts us of the sin. And then we bow our head and we confess it to the Lord, no doubt as Isaiah did. And our sins are purged. Now, if we weren't here, we wouldn't be reminded of that. And we would go on, and those sins would accumulate in our lives. But it's a time to get clean. And then look in verse 8, lastly. In worship, we hear the call to serve. And the Lord says, who will go for me? And he said, here I am, send me. The call to serve is often heard. I would bet conservatively that 90% of the people who are preaching the gospel in America today, 90% of the people who are serving the Lord as missionaries like Mark and his family back there, the people who are in full-time Christian service, I would bet that 90% of those people heard the call in a worship service and said, Lord, I'm tired of fighting it. I'm going to serve you now. And they surrendered to the Lord because they were in the presence of God in a worship service. One more real quick. It's in the book of Luke, chapter 10. And so we have what Paul tells us in Romans 12. He says that worship will change our, when we present our bodies to the Lord, that's worship, then he will conform us to his will and transform our minds. He'll help us to not live a worldly life. He'll reveal his will to us. Isaiah said in worship, sin is revealed. We're led to confession of sin. God touches us, calls us to service. We go to Luke chapter 10. And if you'll follow in your Bible as I begin reading in verse 38, it came to pass as they went that Jesus entered into a certain village. A certain woman named Martha received him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, and here's how Mary is described. Martha receives him. She's the hospitable one. Mary just goes and sits at his feet to hear his word. She's just there to worship him. Martha's in the kitchen making biscuits and roast and whatever. And Martha was cumbered about with much serving. She's overwhelmed. She's cooking lunch for Jesus and who else? I don't know. And she comes out and says, Mary, 
why don't you come in here and help me? I'm doing this all by myself. She's cumbered about with much serving. And Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, twice, Martha, Martha, you are full of care. That's what careful means in our King James Bible. You're full of care. You're full of worry. And you're troubled about many things that are inconsequential in the big picture. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that thing. She's sitting at my feet to hear the Word of God. Take that apart a little bit. Here's what he's saying. Martha, you're troubled about things that they're not eternal. I appreciate you're going to fix a wonderful meal for me. Thank you for your hospitality. But Martha, you're all full of care and trouble. You've lost the joy of even providing the meal. You want me to make her stop worshiping me and go to the kitchen. No, no, no. Martha, Martha, the trouble for your cure, or the, the, the cure for your trouble and, and, and your and, and you're uh, being upset emotionally is that you need to do what Mary's doing more. You need to sit at my feet, and you need to hear my word, Martha. And so, bottom line, one thing is needful. And I don't want you to miss this. Please write this down somewhere where you can see it again. Worship brings peace of mind. Martha, you're troubled. You're full of worry and anxiety. You're under pressure and tension. But if you were worshiping more, you wouldn't have that. Worship brings peace of mind. Brother Bob back here sent me an email just a week or so ago. And it's an email about Tyler Vander Weel. Tyler Vander Weel is a professing Christian, and he is a professor at Harvard University, and he wrote a thesis, a paper, and now hundreds of other people have reviewed it. It's a peer-reviewed paper, and, and it's, it's very well respected, and the abstract at the front of it tells you what the thing is about, and I read from it this week. And I'm quoting now from Professor Tyler Vander Weel of Harvard in his study. He said, quote, participation in religious services is associated with numerous aspects of human flourishing. Things like happiness and life satisfaction, mental and physical health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, and close social relationships. And then the bottom line of his study, his paper, is the best preventative for suicide. The paper was a study of suicide, essentially. People who are taking their lives because of depression, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, etc., the best prevention for suicide is regular church and worship attendance. In fact, he says women, the, the suicide rate of women who are regular church members is 66% less than women in the general population. Worship brings peace of mind. That's what Jesus was saying to uh, Martha. Now, I want to conclude with with, with something. I want to talk to you about then to draw what I've set, tried to say here, the importance of gathering together in corporate worship. You see, going to church regularly and faithfully is really in our society is the primary mark of a Christian. Now, a lot of people go to church regularly who are not Christians. I understand that. But I don't know very many people who are good, solid, Bible-believing Christians who don't go to church if they can in fact, people don't talk about people being saved. They, they'll talk about, some, well, he started going to church. He got religion and all that. Well, I, I don't know what they mean by that. But, but it's kind of synonymous with becoming a Christian in our, our world. 
And in your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 10, if you will, real quickly today. Hebrews chapter 10. Man, I should have made this three messages. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, it says, forsake not. That's a directive, isn't it? Forsake not. Do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves, the assembling together of yourselves. And then I want you to look at that last phrase, and so much the more. As you see the day approaching, what is the day? It's the coming of Christ. As we near the time when we as believers believe that the Bible is saying that Christ, is, His coming could be very near, even more so then do we need to be faithful in our worship of Almighty God. So worship, corporate worship, is the command of God. Not a, when, when I preach about it, well, the preacher's ranting away. I mean, people, not enough people coming to church and so on. Please don't think that. This is the Word of God. He says that we are to absolutely faithfully worship Him. There were even extreme penalties for not worshiping in the Old Testament in Israel. And so God has not changed. It's important. But then in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, I'll just quote this one, because worship carries the promise of God's blessing, of His presence. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, I'll be there. Doesn't have to be a big crowd. Doesn't have to be a big church. I drove in here this morning, and it was raining a little bit, and I wanted to help Norma get in the building, and not in the rain. And so I drove around and came up under the port of Cachet, and then I drove around the whole building. I'll tell you, my heart was just full of joy. I just was so thankful. Hundreds and hundreds of cars parked around this building today of people who had come to worship God. And it brought real joy to me. And, but you don't have to have a big crowd where two or three are gathered. And I go to the book of Acts. Listen to me. I'm reasoning with you now. And in chapter 2, God comes the Holy Spirit begins to work powerfully when the people are gathered in worship. In chapter 4, they've been suffering persecution. They're gathered again, and the Holy Spirit comes when they're gathered. In chapter 5, they have a church discipline issue. People are sinning against the Lord, but it's when the church is gathered that the Holy Spirit comes and works that out. In chapter 12, they're about to kill Peter the next morning. And the angel comes in answer to a prayer meeting that's being held by the gathered church, not one person over here and one over there. And then in Acts chapter 13, they send out the missionaries from the gathered church. It's not anybody's individual responsibility here to send missionaries. It's the church's responsibility to send the missionaries. And we see the local church is the center of what God is doing in the New Testament. I go to Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. You might want to write this one down because Jesus set the example of regular worship attendance for us. Luke 4, 16, as his custom was on the Sabbath day. As his custom was. It was the habit of the Lord Jesus Christ to faithfully and regularly worship. The first Sabbath that he was in the ministry, he went home to Nazareth, and he preached in the synagogue. And then Acts 5 and 42, daily in the temple, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, many people today think that church going is sort of a, a, a non-essential. You do it if you, you, know, if you want to but I can be a good Christian and go to church. Look me in the eye. No, you can't. I've never met a great, great Christian who could go to church and wouldn't. You know why? You can't even do the things the Lord commanded you to do. You can't do the Great Commission by yourself. You need the church for that. You can't carry out the one another's, and there's 59 of them, like love one another. Well, there's got to be somebody to love can't do that at home. Serve one another. Can't do that by yourself. Build up one another, edifying one another, exhorting one another, and I could go on. 
And I say that, and here's why. Because COVID, along with the government lockdowns and the fear-mongering by the media, caused a lot of Christians across this country to opt for staying home rather than gathering with God's people. And we still have a good bit of that happening across the country. Yesterday, I was talking to a lady in the grocery store, and she was lamenting the fact of the decline in church attendance at her, at her particular church. Now, listen to me. We found out that the social distancing really didn't work. The mask really didn't work. The lockdowns didn't work. The vaccine didn't keep people out of the hospitals and from getting the, the, the flu. It might have helped a little bit minimally, marginally. But you know what had happened? It put fear in people. That was the, that, that was the tragic thing. It, it brought a spirit of fear like I've never seen in the country. And now I'm thankful for the tools that God has given us. Right now we're on TV, we're on live stream, we're on YouTube, we're on fit Facebook, we're on the website. We have all these tools. But please hear me. And those of you who are sitting home who have not come back to church, I love you. I, I, want, I want to serve you. But I want to look that camera straight in the eye. And I want to say to you, staying home and watching if you can be here is no substitute for corporate worship of God. You ought to be here. You ought to be here. Now, I'll tell you who that's for. We provide live stream for the sick. We provide it for the caregivers. It was a blessing to me when I was out sick and I watched Chris and I watched Jeff and I watched, well, all the staff, Chris, the other Chris, and all, I watched the guys preach. I'm glad we had it. But now if I were there today, it wouldn't be right. It's for sick people and caregivers. It's for people that don't have transportation. Here's somebody you don't think of because I talk to them all the time. It's for people who go to liberal churches, and they tune in, and they hear the Word of God, and they communicate with me, and they tell me that. And then it's for people where no Bible-based church is available. Every week, we've got supporters in Oregon, Texas, Michigan, Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Canada, We've got missionaries around the world, and they watch. And there's not a good church. Sometimes there's no church at all. A couple in Oregon said there's not even a church within 50 miles of us. Not any church. So we want to provide what we can for them, do we not? But we don't want to train our people that it's an option, an alternative to being gathered with God's people. Please hear me in the spirit in which I say it to you. You know, a decline in worship is a last day sign. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about that, and I'm going to give you the six things that are essential to worshiping God tonight. I hope you'll come and bring your Bible and write them down and then begin to practice them at home, in your family, in your devotional life. But when you come to church, Maybe you can get a lot more out of it than you have in the past because of the six things I'm going to tell you tonight. Worship is not a discretionary activity. Worship is not, if, well, if we don't have any plans or any activities we would prefer to do, we'll go to church. No, 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 no. And I want to encourage you to learn to worship God and it become the most meaningful essential thing in your life. Verse 21, and I'm through. God smelled the smoke of the sacrifice, and He was pleased. And when we present our bodies a living sacrifice, don't you think the Lord is pleased today too? And so you have an opportunity every time you come to be a sweet savor in the nostrils of our Lord as we worship Him in spirit and in truth. Stand to your feet with me, if you will, please.